resource. Workers today uncover a box believed to be a time capsule from the late 1800s from the base of a now removed Robert E. Lee statue in Virginia's capital, which historians think may contain historic artifacts related to the Confederacy. The discovery comes a week after the contents of another time capsule located under the statue was a letdown for many observers. The major announcement from the CDC tonight with new guidelines shortening its recommended COVID isolation period from 10 days to five days for those testing positive but showing no symptoms, followed by five days of mask wearing when around others. The move comes as cases of Omicron surge this holiday week and Americans wait in hours long lines for testing while troubling rise in pediatric COVID hospitalizations is seen in parts of the country. The travel nightmare for many Americans this holiday weekend with more than a thousand flights canceled today after thousands more were called off over the Christmas weekend. Airlines pointing to Omicron fueled crew shortages and bad weather as thousands were left stranded. What can travelers do if caught in the travel mess? We'll have the latest. That travel mess coming as millions of Americans prepare for a winter blast. Record cold snow and rain already hitting out west, and the Midwest is already under blizzard warnings as the systems move towards the east coast. Rob Marciano is here with the forecast. Americans spending big this holiday season as new data shows retail sales jumped to the biggest increase in nearly two decades. Concerns over inflation, the supply chain and the pandemic not keeping Americans away from shopping in person or online. Plus what you need to know to manage those holiday gift returns. And Furnishing Hope, the D.C. nonprofit that is finding new homes for used furniture. They have already helped hundreds bring comfort to a community in need. Yeah, I think that what it says, Furnish Hope. So it's bigger than just furniture. When people come in, they're in despair, they're confused, they're depressed. And our goal, Nikki and I, is always to see them smile when they leave. Good evening and thanks for streaming with us. I'm Rachel Scott in for Lindsay Davis. If there's a theme tonight, we'd say it's holiday mess. And of course, by that, we hope you're not impacted by it. But first, a major policy shift as Omicron cases surge across the country. The CDC has shortened its recommended COVID isolation period from 10 days to five for those who test positive but do not have any symptoms, followed by five days of wearing a mask when around others. This comes as Americans wait hours to get COVID tested and supplies run low. And with cases up, pediatric hospitalizations are also on the rise in parts of the country. President Biden today said the government's pandemic response is, quote, clearly not enough and there's more work to do. Also tonight, the gnarly holiday travel across the country. More than a thousand flights were canceled today alone after thousands more were called off over the weekend, leaving travelers stranded at airports and scrambling to get home. The airlines blaming crew shortages fueled by the virus and bad winter weather. What officials are saying tonight and the debate over requiring vaccinations before flying? We have a lot to get to and ABC's Marcus Moore leads us off. Tonight, the CDC changing guidance for all Americans who get infected with the coronavirus but are asymptomatic, recommending they isolate for five days instead of 10, and if still without symptoms, mask for five more days. Their close contacts should also quarantine for five days from exposure if they are unvaccinated or late for their booster. The CDC pointing to evidence that most transmission happens early on in the illness. It comes as new COVID cases skyrocket to 206,000. In a meeting with governors today, the president acknowledging Americans need more COVID tests. Seeing how tough it was for some folks to get a test this weekend shows that we have more work to do and we're doing it. You're welcome. Have a good one. In Miami today, some waiting hours to get their hands on COVID test kits after stores ran out. I've been here since 645. For days now, long lines for testing stretching beyond parking lots and around city blocks. It's like, how many places are we going to go to where they say, sorry, no testing? It's like I have to work. The White House planning to send out 500 million free test kits starting next month. We have to do more. We have to do better. And we will. Before any impact from Christmas gatherings, the Omicron surge is already nearing last winter's peak. New York today enacting its new sweeping vaccine mandate for all private sector workers. I am 110% convinced this was the right thing to do. It remains the right thing to do, um, particularly 
with the ferocity of Omicron. It comes as the number of children hospitalized in New York is up fivefold. None of the 5 to 11 year old patients were vaccinated. This is a wake up call to everyone that even if this virus is truly mild, if we continue to let it spread throughout the country and have over 100,000 positive cases in kids week by week, we inevitably will see a lot more illness. In Chicago, 13-year-old Sebastian Iracheta was unvaccinated, got COVID, and almost wound up on a ventilator. When you're sitting there and you're looking at your child and you don't know if they're going to live, you don't know if they're going to make it, it's such a struggle to see them. Thankfully, Sebastian made it through. His mom regrets not getting him vaccinated because she was afraid to miss work. I don't think anybody should feel safe and think that it's not going to make its way to your house. Tonight, the spread of the highly contagious Omicron variant disrupting more holiday plans. Outbreaks aboard Carnival and Holland America cruises sending thousands of vaccinated passengers and crew back to port. We were all wondering, you know, do any of the passengers have it? You know, how extensive it is? New Year's Eve in Times Square scaled back to require proof of vaccination, masks, and social distancing. And despite encouraging news from South Africa, where Omicron cases are now dropping sharply, Experts warn it is too early to predict when that will happen here. It's going to get worse before it gets better, that's for sure. We don't expect things are going to turn around in a few days to a week. It likely will take much longer than that, but that's unpredictable. Just as Israel today started testing a fourth vaccine shot, officials in this country are urging more Americans to get the shot. The president today warning with millions still unvaccinated, hospitals in some places will be overrun. From Nebraska to New Hampshire, doctors are already feeling the strain. We're caring for three to four times as many patients than we ever have, and we don't have enough staff to do so. Hospitals bracing for the worst. ABC's Marcus Moore joins us now. Marcus, I want to get back to those new CDC guidelines for isolation and for quarantine. You're learning that there are also different recommendations for boosted Americans who are exposed to COVID. Yeah, that's right, Rachel. Under this new guidance, those who have boosters do not need to quarantine after exposure, but uh, they should wear a mask for 10 days and get tested. But health officials stress if symptoms do occur, they should immediately quarantine until a negative test confirms it is not COVID. Rachel. Marcus Moore tracking it all for us. Marcus, thank you. And with the rate of new cases across the United States continuing to rise, the nation's top health experts are offering a stern new warning ahead of New Year's celebrations. Joining us now to get some clarity on the situation is Chief Innovation Officer at Boston Children's Hospital, ABC News medical contributor Dr. John Brownstein. Dr. Brownstein, so much to unpack here. So first things first, the CDC has just announced that it will shorten the recommended time for isolation from 10 days for people with COVID-19 to five days if they are asymptomatic. Now that of course would be followed by five days of wearing a mask when around others. But what kind of science is behind this decision and why are we seeing this change right now? Well, good evening, Rachel. I think this is really important and timely. As we accumulate more data about infectiousness and transmission, it's important that we keep up with the science and update guidance. You know, the 10-day isolation is a lot to ask of people, and especially if you're trying to get people to adhere to these protocols, we need to make sure that they're based on science. And as we know now, you know, symptoms um, occur within one to two days in, and uh, of being infected, you know, at that point you're contagious, you know, that contagiousness period can take about three to five days. So, you know, you're not really contagious beyond that. So it was important for CDC to keep up with that, especially with Omicron, super important that, you know, people adhere to this. And it's really important to get people out of isolation. We saw that with this with our healthcare workers, but now more broadly to get people back to work. This is going to be important in the next few weeks. Yeah, the CDC director has always made it clear that they will follow the science. It seems like everyone at this point knows someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. Do you agree with Dr. Fauci that things will get worse before they get better? You know, I think unfortunately that's true. If you look at where we're at in terms of a surge in cases, we're beyond where we were at with the Delta variant. Now, it's great news that this variant is likely less severe, but the sheer amount of transmission that's occurring over this holiday period means that we're going to see an increase in hospitalizations. We're already seeing EDs packed. It's a matter of time where before we see that increase in hospitalizations. But I do think there, you know, is a light at the end of a tunnel. If you look at other countries where this this wave has gone pretty quickly, that's the hope 
that we will have in the next few weeks. We don't know yet, but you know, we just need to get through these next few weeks with people just helping to reduce transmission in the community through vaccination, boosters, masking, and limited mobility. We are also seeing pediatric hospitalizations levels rise in the United States. They're surging to the highest point since the early fall. So for all the parents out there, what should they be on the lookout to protect their children? You know, this is a real concerning trend. It's not because necessarily Omicron is more severe in kids. It's just that our kids remain unvaccinated for the most part. You know, we're only seeing about a third of kids under 18 vaccinated. Um, kids obviously under five are yet to get that immunity that their adults have gotten. So this is why kids remain at risk. And this is why it's important for the adults and those eligible around them to get vaccinated, to get boosted, to mask, to make sure you're not exposing kids in large crowded settings. You know, keep doing what we've been doing throughout the pandemic, but recognize that there's just so much more transmission in the community. So we sort of have to double down on all these measures to keep our kids safe. And people nationwide gathered to celebrate the holidays when we were already seeing a large increase in cases. We saw those images of busy airports. So if you find out that you were in close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19, what should you do now? And how does that answer differ for people who are vaccinated versus people who are not vaccinated? Well, you know, you know, actually, these guidelines just changed in a matter of hours ago uh, for quarantine. And the CDC essentially has lumped in people that are unvaccinated with people that are six months out from their vaccination and haven't gotten a booster. The recommendation is five days of quarantine followed by five days uh, of masking. If, you know, you, you are vaccinated and boosted, that is different. And you can actually, you know, not enter quarantine. But the recommendation is to do 10 days of masking and get that test because it's so important to identify whether you're infected. So at day five, try to get that test, identify whether you're infected. Either way, if you're symptomatic, you should enter quarantine and try to get testing because, of course, there's so much transmission in the community that if you do develop those symptoms, it is very likely to be Omicron. Important advice there. And I want to get to the testing. The shortage of testing is a major issue in the country right now. We're seeing empty shelves, long lines. What is your reaction to this? And what is your advice to Americans who are trying to find a test and just cannot get one? You know, this is a real travesty. I mean, we should have been better prepared. We knew that testing was the key to getting out of this pandemic, and now it's become a bottleneck once again. Testing is key to identifying infections and limiting transmission in the community. So we're back to it again. Um, the reality is people should try to see if they can find testing in the community or use those at-home rapid tests. Those are super key because they can identify whether you're contagious. But at the end of the day, if you do have symptoms and you can't get tests, just assume that you're positive because infections are so rampant and you know go into that protocol of quarantine if you do have those symptoms and eventually you'll get that test but you know we can assume that you can wait and get a test result in a few days because by that time you may have transmitted the virus and sort of enable chains of transmission i know this is so frustrating for so many people help is on the way in january with you know free tests coming but until then you know we just have to do what we can to limit transmission among our households and in the community and the Biden administration announcing that they will be making 500 million at-home test kits available in January, but unfortunately too late for the holiday season. Dr. Brownstein, we appreciate it so much for walking us through all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And now to the setbacks the variants are causing in the skies. Thousands of flights canceled over the weekend and some more today. That mix with the weather impacting the West is creating a less than pleasant experience, to say the least. ABC's Alex Perez has more. Tonight, no end in sight to the travel nightmare playing out at airports across the country. It's terrible, especially when you're trying to travel during the holiday. More than 3,000 flights never took off this weekend, ruining many families' Christmas plans. And more than 1,100 flights canceled today. Latasha Williams is trying to get back home to New Orleans with her family. Their flight already delayed the crowded airport, adding to her frustration. Having to be around so many people at one time, that's the chaos for me. Weather, especially in the West, partly to blame. Heavy snow in Seattle, grounding dozens of flights Sunday. Feet of snow in the Sierra and whiteout conditions in Minnesota. But the main problem, Come on down, guys. rising COVID cases forcing staff to call in sick or isolate. We've got to make sure that employees don't feel pressured to come to work 
when they've been exposed to COVID. Dr. Anthony Fauci suggesting today it may be time to require proof of vaccination to fly domestically. When you make vaccination a requirement, that's another incentive to get more people vaccinated. If you want to do that with domestic flights, I think that's something that seriously should be considered. But so far, no decision on making that a mandatory requirement. And no decision just yet on those testing requirements. Alex Perez joins us from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Alex, we hear you have some useful tips for all of those travelers stuck at airports. How can they get their money back? Yeah, Rachel, if your flight was canceled or severely delayed, the airlines will give you a refund. You just have to ask for it. As for the vouchers, only take the voucher if that's the option you prefer. Also, a lot of credit cards have insurance when it comes to travel and hotel, so make sure to check with your cards too. Rachel? Travel nightmare for so many. Thank you, Alex. And we now shift to that dangerous winter weather causing headaches for travelers. More than 20 states on alert coast to coast. Western storms now heading east. ABC's Rob Marciano is here to tell us all about it. Rob? Hey, Rachel, you know, we're getting into a bit of a pattern shift where these storms in the west are starting to make their way across the country all the way to the east coast. And we're getting one right now, and it's bringing some wintry precipitation, especially to inland areas away from the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, winter weather advisories have been posted. So here's the radar. You see some of that uh, snow, sleet, and rain and freezing rain coming into uh, parts of Pennsylvania, Scranton, Syracuse, Ithaca, Albany. Hartford, Springfield, you're all in this area that uh, could see, you know, a half an inch to an inch of some sort of winter precip, if not a glaze of, of, of uh, freezing rain potentially on some of the secondary roads by morning. It does clear out by 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, but it will be chilly. That first couple hours tomorrow morning could be a problem. All right, this all comes from the west, which has really been getting slammed the past two weeks. I mean, I set a record a December snow record there at Donner Pass near Truckee of 16 feet of snow. They're going to get up in over 200 inches. I'm confident in that before this this week or this year is out. And here are all the advisors are out. Avalanches are becoming a big problem. It's winter break and there's a lot of people playing in the back country. So uh, that's an issue as well. More snow coming and big time wet, cold temperatures way below normal on the west coast and the interior intermountain west really really cold stuff tomorrow warm morning wind chills will be minus 11 in rapid city to say minus 22 in bismarck meanwhile it'll be very warm across parts of the southeast rachel that's the spot to go although a lot of the energy from this next system gets into the southeast we may see some severe weather there by wednesday and thursday so we're tracking that there's a price to pay when you get temperatures in the 60s and 70s in december so we'll <laughs> monitor that for sure rachel bracing for the bitter cold all right rob thanks you bet and we and we move now to the tributes pouring in from around the world for Desmond Tutu. The Nobel Peace Prize winner was the voice of faith and moral courage in the long campaign to end the racist apartheid regime in South Africa. He died over the weekend at the age of 90. ABC's Ian Panel has more. It was Desmond Tutu's faith that gave him the strength to tackle the racist apartheid system in South Africa with a message of non-violence. Tutu grew up under the oppression of segregation, violently enforced by the white minority government. But against the odds, becoming the first black Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, as South Africa teetered ever closer to the brink of civil war. Tutu stood shoulder to shoulder with Nelson Mandela on a mission to end apartheid. The campaign for economic sanctions and his lobbying for divestment picking up support around the world, including the US. Students at major universities protested, demanding their institutions stop investing in companies with financial ties to South Africa. It helped cripple the apartheid economy and made reform inevitable. His life's work would earn him the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984. Tutu used religion to unify people of all faiths with a message of shared humanity, preaching kindness and forgiveness. <laughs> Even amidst the darkness of apartheid, his sermons and speeches spread a message of love, joy and laughter. Tutu sought to fight injustice in all its forms, speaking to Robin Roberts in 2007 on its most silent kind. What do you see right now as the biggest challenge that we have to overcome? Poverty. 
poverty, poverty is so demeaning. It is so dehumanizing. And you say, hey, when are we going to get it? We don't get it, do we? I mean, that is so obvious. We've got the capacity to feed everybody. His tireless advocacy for peace, touching generations, transcending religion. At the age of 76, he continued to be a force, leading a mission to war-torn Darfur. What do you hope to accomplish there? We want to say to them, in a way, what do you want to be remembered for? Do you want to be remembered f for as someone who actually assisted in the destruction of so many people? Or do you want to leave a legacy? And I think, I mean, that most human beings, you know, most human beings want to be remembered for good things. Today, spiritual and world leaders remembering Tutu for his global impact and his kind heart. Desmond Tutu possesses that sense of generosity, that spirit of unity, that essence of humanity that South Africans know simply as Ubuntu. A life and legacy that will most certainly be remembered. Our thanks to Ian. When we come back, a hit and run in Florida claims the lives of two children and sends four others to a local hospital, bringing the latest on the investigation. And after a busy holiday shopping season, we'll show you the best practices for pain-free returns if you got something that you didn't want and what to do if you wait too long. And an interpreter who worked for years with the U.S. Marines in some Afghanistan's most dangerous places is now making a new life for himself and his family here in the United States. Their story when we return. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. Where the sky... He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Who's all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run with Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen She's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right.
And welcome back. When the U.S. military withdrew from Afghanistan and the Taliban regained control this summer, many Afghans who had helped American forces over the past two decades were in danger and forced to flee. Our Martha Raddatz was in touch with one interpreter named Abdul as he tried to escape during those chaotic days at the airport. And last week, Martha reunited with him and his family at a military base in New Jersey to reflect on their daunting journey to safety. It was a moment many months and thousands of miles in the making. An emotional reunion with Abdul, Lima, and their three daughters after their harrowing escape from Afghanistan. When we first met the family last summer in Kabul as the Taliban was sweeping through Afghanistan, Abdul, who had worked alongside American Marines as an interpreter, already feared Kabul would fall. And he, like so many other interpreters, would be a target. I know that I will be killed by the Taliban. His fears were well-founded. It was 18 of August that I was out of my home. Suddenly I received a call from Lema, my wife. She told me the Taliban came to our house and asking about Abdul's. Tell me about that day, Lima. I didn't open the door. I told him there is no man at home. And after a few minutes, they left and they told me that we are coming back. On that time, I was really scared. I love her. She saved my life. They knew they had no choice but to flee. Abdul reached out to old friends in the military and anyone else who might help. And this successful engineer and his journalist wife left their home and belongings behind and made the perilous journey to the airport. It was very difficult because I told Dulema, I can put my life at risk, no problems. But I couldn't put the life of my wife and my children at risk because many people has been killed in there and around the uh, airport. What were you telling the girls? I was told them that uh, be patient, everything will be fine. Uh, with my hands, I put the, on her, her hairs. Yeah, like that, this. Yeah, so she that, she should, uh, that she hear. cannot uh, hear the, uh, the sound of firing. They were the lucky ones. Cutting their way through the chaos with help from ABC News, they made their way into the airport, spent the night on the tarmac, boarded a plane to Qatar, and then eventually on to the United States. Do you know what you want to be when you grow up? Yes, yes. we want. Yes. What do you want to be? Dentist. A dentist. What do you want to be? Pilot. Pilot. And for two months now, home has been this temporary camp at a military base in New Jersey. It's a far cry from the comfortable life they led in Afghanistan, but they show nothing but gratitude, worrying only about the girls. That longing, something the officials running the camp have grown used to dealing with. Colonel, what are the... You were from Afghanistan, correct? Yes, ma'am. You know the culture, you know the challenges. What, what, what is the challenge that you're seeing right now? Well, the biggest is when you leave your home, right? That's the, <clears throat> the hardest part, because uh, they're a very traumatized population. Uh, they've left a lot of loved ones behind. You know, the other night we, had a, we, we hold, hold town hall meetings to talk to the, the population, and a, and a man uh, held up a, his cell phone with a picture of a person and said, this is my cousin, and he was murdered two days ago by the Taliban. It's things like that that happen all the time, and they, they really hit home and, and remind you of why these people are here and, and why we need to help them. <laughs> It is still unclear when Abdul and the family will be able to leave this camp and start a new life in this new country. And for Abdul, a chance to find some way to fight for the one he lost. I'm remembering the, the message you had that if the Taliban found you, you were willing to die and you were proud of what you had done with the Americans. Still I am proud. Still, I'm proud, and I will fight against the Taliban, against of their ideologies, against of their insurgents, up to my end of my life, because I'm against them. Our thanks to Martha. Still ahead here on Prime, at least 35,000 people have been forced from their homes in Brazil as heavy flooding creates life-threatening conditions for nearly 40 different cities that now must also face the dangers of two broken dams. 
And did you not get what you wanted for Christmas or maybe that nice new sweater is just a little bit too big? Well, we've got the tips and tricks to make hassle-free returns for your holiday fixings. But first, our tweet of the day remembering director Jean-Marc Vallée, who died suddenly this weekend at the age of 58. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now to the holiday shopping surge, retail sales jumping to its biggest increase in nearly two decades. Turns out concerns over inflation, the supply chain, and the pandemic could not keep shoppers away this holiday season. Here's a look by the numbers. Holiday sales spiked 8.5% this year compared to last holiday season. That's according to a report by MasterCard. And yes, Americans are still shopping in person, but traffic at brick and mortar stores making a bit of a comeback with a sales increase of 8.1%. But it wasn't enough to surpass online shopping. E-commerce grew by an even bigger amount, 11% in just a year. This season, nearly 21% of all retail sales were made online. That's up 15% from back in 2019. So what are Americans buying this holiday season? Well, clothing saw the biggest sales hike up a whopping 47% from last year. Next up was jewelry up 32% followed by electronics. And finally, despite those concerns about the global supply chain, it appears Santa Claus got a little help this holiday season. Get this, about 98% of packages were delivered on time this Christmas. That's according to a report by Ship Matrix. The company 
says much of that success was because Americans shopped early and in person. And still ahead here on Prime, a hit and run in Florida leaves two children dead and sends four others to the hospital, the latest on the investigation. Thousands of cranes have died due to a fast-moving outbreak. We'll bring you the latest on authorities' attempts to prevent it from passing on to humans. And warnings have been issued for people in Japan ahead of the fierce winter storm that is currently blanketing most of the country. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people news. squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. New guidance from the CDC recommending shortening the isolation time for people who test positive for COVID from 10 days to five if they have no symptoms. After five days, if the person does not have any symptoms, they can go about their normal activities, but must wear a mask for five more days. And if you're boosted and exposed to someone with COVID, you can skip quarantine, but still must wear a mask in all settings for 10 days. From New Hampshire to California, across the nation lines at COVID-19 testing sites are stretching around the block. We just got back from a plane and everybody was coughing so we really want to see if we ha have COVID or not. Ordered FEMA to set up pop-up sites in places with high demand. Cruise passengers are experiencing the uncertainty of vacations during the rise in COVID-19 cases. In San Diego, Holland America cruise ship Koningsdam returning to port after being denied entry to Puerto Vallarta by Mexican authorities. They kept saying, we're delayed, we're delayed, we're delayed, and finally the captain got on and said, we're leaving in an hour. According to the Mexican Ministry of Health, when the vessel arrived in Mexico, 21 crew members tested positive for COVID. 
After public outcry, the Colorado truck driver who was sentenced to 110 years in prison for a fatal crash that killed four people and injured others will get his sentence reconsidered in January. I ask for your patience as we take steps provided for in law as we consider a new sentence. Today's hearing comes after the district attorney, Alexis King, said she would seek a sentence that ranged between 20 to 30 years in prison, calling it a sentence that reflects, quote, an appropriate outcome for Aguilera Madero's conduct. The DA's motion in response to these calls for justice belted out from the steps of the courthouse. They're echoed by nearly 5 million people who signed an online petition asking for his controversial sentence to be reduced. But Gage Evans, whose husband died in this fiery pileup, believes the court made the right decision. For people to recognize that, um, that he was responsible for killing my husband gave me the chance to breathe. Amtrak says that one of its trains has collided with a vehicle at a railroad crossing about 40 minutes north of Boston near the Massachusetts-New Hampshire border. Amtrak says no one on the train was injured. As the U.S. Supreme Court considers rolling back Roe versus Wade, a key player in the landmark decision making abortion a constitutional right has died. 26-year-old attorney Sarah Weddington was approached in the early 1970s to challenge the state's ban on abortions. They said, well, how much would you charge us? And I said, oh, I'd do it for free. And they said, you are our lawyer. Weddington died yesterday in Austin at age 76. The Spanish island of La Palma, everyone there breathing a huge sigh of relief. The volcano eruption there has finally been declared over. The last major volcanic activity was measured December 13th, but scientists waited until Christmas Day to give the all clear. During 85 days of eruption, the lava flow covered nearly five square miles, forcing thousands of people to evacuate, the lava destroying some 3,000 properties. Your dreams of becoming ridiculously rich and living a life on Easy Street is just a Powerball drop away tonight. Since no one matched all the winning numbers on Christmas night, tonight's jackpot has climbed to $416 million. The last time someone hit the jackpot was October 4th, when a single ticket paid out a massive $700 million grand prize. Well, since then, there have been 34 drawings without a total match. And now to a horrific hit and run accident outside Fort Lauderdale where a driver plowed into a group of children. At least two have been killed. ABC's Victor Okendo is at the scene with the latest. The horrific scene unfolding in Wilton Manors, Florida this afternoon. CDC is saying there's possibly six children. Authorities say at least two children were struck and killed by a hit and run driver. One child is stuck underneath the vehicle. Four other children hurt and sent to the hospital. Rescuers rushing them to the emergency room. First responders say the youngest victims in the hospital are between the ages of one and nine. At least one of them said to be in critical condition. This is a heartbreaking evening for everyone, for family, friends, and for the first responders. Streets have been closed off the traffic. Drivers told to avoid the area as traffic homicide investigates. Our thanks to Victor. We turn now to the latest technology that could revolutionize early breast cancer detection. It's a story we first saw in the Washington Post, and ABC's Janae Norman spoke to the MIT professor who is leading the charge. Researchers are revealing a new diagnostic tool in the battle against breast cancer. While mammograms have long been considered the gold standard in breast cancer detection, a new technology developed by MIT professor Regina Barzilai and her student Adam Yala could soon change how women check their health. It's called Mirai, an artificial intelligence that they say can see beyond what the human eye can detect on mammograms and determine if a patient is at risk up to five years earlier than current tools allow. How did you train the machine? The way you train the machine, it's in a very similar way as your iPhone is trained to identify your face. Um, you just give to it a lot of examples of images with known outcomes and machine is trained um, to kind of correlate the distribution of pixels 
to predict the future, uh, to tell who is likely to get breast cancer. The technology is still in development and undergoing medical trials. Regina even using her own mammograms to test the accuracy of the technology. She scanned her first mammogram from 2012 seen here in Tamarai. From that 2012 picture, the AI determined that she was at high risk, something her doctors didn't identify until 2014 when it was this mammogram seen here that led to her breast cancer diagnosis. Mirai was correct about 76% of the time. 76% is millions of women, people who could benefit from this technology. What does that potential mean to you? You can assess what's to come and then you can reori reorient yourself and some of it can be medication, some of it changing your lifestyle. Not only changing the rate of detection, but also potentially changing the course of treatment early on, possibly saving millions of lives. If this technology is used in the uniform way, first of all, uh, we can identify early who are high risk patient and intervene. The, the earlier the cancer is detected, uh, the easier it is to treat it and the outcomes are much better. Incredible research there. Our thanks to Janae. And we're tracking several headlines from around the world. Residents in northeastern Brazil resorted to everything from mattresses to kayaks to get around after two dams gave way due to heavy weeks, weeks of heavy rains. According to local officials, about 67 towns are facing emergency situations. Up to now, there have been no reports of deaths or injuries. And the worst blow to wildlife in the country's history. That's what the Israeli prime minister called an outbreak of the bird flu. More than 5,000 migratory cranes have been killed, causing authorities to declare a popular natural reserve off limits to visitors. Israeli media said children who had visited the reserve may have touched an infected crane and in turn contributed to the spread of the flu. Authorities were looking to import eggs from abroad to avert an egg shortage. Heavy snow continued to blanket northern and western Japan over the weekend and through today. The Japanese Weather Agency urged people to refrain from non-essential outings as the snowfall could leave vehicles stranded on the roads. National media reported they expect a total of about 35 inches to fall by tomorrow morning. Well, now that the holidays have come and gone, you're likely left with an expanded waistline and a bunch of gifts that you do not want. According to one report, two out of three consumers will return at least one gift during the holiday season. Trey Bodge, shopping, smart shopping expert for TrueTrade.com, joins us to share the best practices for pain-free returns and what to do if you wait too long. Good to see you, Trey. So let's just get right to it. What are the top line things that we need to know for returning all of those unwanted gifts? Well, thanks for having me, Rachel. I mean, the really the thing that we need to keep in mind is that the gifts that you return should be in as pristine condition as possible. So if it's apparel, you should have the tags on or at least with the item. If the item came in a box, you should make sure it's back in the box with the interior packaging because that will create a much easier process for you when you're standing in line at the store or you're trying to mail something back. So another thing we got to think about is the return window. So what exactly is that window during the holidays? So they do vary from retailer to retailer. So it's really important that prior to going into the store or attempting to return online that you familiarize yourself with what that policy is. Typically, most retailers allow some time into January for returning. So even if a gift has been purchased say, at the beginning of uh, October or November, you have some time into January. But I wouldn't really give more than a couple of weeks there. Uh, so just make sure that you familiarize yourself first before you go to the trouble to attempt your return. Don't procrastinate for too long. So when is the ideal time to return in store versus returning online? So I think it's the same for both. I would not rush back right now, especially for stores, because what you're going to find is that the stores are potentially crowded. There are long lines. The sales folks might be frustrated. So this is not really the time to do that. And same with when you go to the post office right now, you're going to find long lines. So for me, the sweet spot is really that that first week of January. Things will be a little quieter, a little calmer, and you can potentially have a better returning experience. So we've all been there, Trey. You get an item, you get a gift, and there's no receipt. So what should you do about returning that item if you do not have a gift receipt for it? 
Yeah, so receipts are very helpful. So if you ever give a gift to someone, enclosing that receipt is really helpful. But if in if that item is in pristine condition and you know that it was purchased at that retailer, you should be fine. Uh, you might have to talk to the giver and see if they can give you a receipt with no amount on it. That's always helpful as well. So as much information as you can provide is really helpful. Of course, if you don't have a receipt, you it's less likely that you'll receive a credit, say, on your credit card. You might get a store credit credit for that item. Mm. And to all the procrastinators out there, what do you do if you miss the return window at major retailer stores? Yeah, so this is a little tricky. If you miss the return window and you go back to return something, the retailer may not take it back, or you might get, say, clearance level value on that item, which is not ideal. So I have a couple of suggestions. So first of all, there are resale sites, and there are resale sites for almost every category, from clothing to tech. So for instance, mpb.com, which is a site that I work with, they specialize in camera and videography equipment. You can sell your gift back to them. They will pay you out in cash very quickly. Or if you are interested in that kind of equipment, you can get what you want, something gently used from that company with a 60-day warranty. So that's a great option. And then the other option is regifting. Uh, I'm not really a fan of letting the new recipient know that you're regifting. So I like to repackage that up and make it look perfect uh, to regift. And then the other thing is that's fun is a gift swap with friends. You want to be very careful that you're not trying to swap with someone that you gave a gift to or received a gift from. But but, you know, something that's not a good fit for you might be a great fit for a friend. And that could be a fun thing that you can do after the holidays, of course, gathering safely. Wow, that's a creative idea there, Trey, a gift swap. That's really great. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for the tips and thanks for joining us again today. Thanks so much, Trey. Thanks for having me back. All right, and coming up on Prime, you'll see how two women are bringing hope to those who need it most. Their story when we return. Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News is America's number one news source. 
With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. And welcome back. Now to the two women behind a remarkable nonprofit furnishing hope to those who need it in Washington, D.C. ABC's Kenneth Milton has a story. In this section of Southeast Washington, D.C., hope is being handed out one piece of furniture at a time. Okay. It's not what we give you, it's what you like because we want your home to feel comfortable and love. Behind this organized chaos, Nikki Mock and Adrian Herbert, co-founders of Furnish Hope DC, the women trying to put furniture into the homes of those without. I was hearing from all these people I knew in Ward 8 that people were in crisis here, people, you know, desperately needed things, and there was no one. Ward 8 includes Anacostia. The community has a rich history in the nation's capital, but is also economically depressed. What we have available today is... Here, where more than 20% of families live below the poverty line, families in need of so much are likely to have empty homes. No couches, no tables, no beds. We've had families come in that were like sleeping on air beds that were deflated. So they were sleeping on the floor. And Nikki and I both have sat in this office and cried. And I'm a mom of five myself, so I understand what it is not to have at times. During the pandemic, Mock says it was a perfect storm. Many nonprofits shut down. Tens of thousands of nonprofit positions gone. With people still in need, Mock happened to notice more gently used furniture on the curb in her Bethesda, Maryland community. There's a lot of redecorating going on, a lot of moving to second homes, taking care of themselves, but all of a sudden there was this plethora of furniture. So she went to work, loading up her truck with whatever she could carry or get help lifting. Oh, I've never not been able to get a piece of furniture that I want. Sometimes the donor has to help me and they'll say, well, I'm 58 years old, I'm not supposed to be. I'm like, okay, I'm 63. <laughs> I'm not supposed to either, but let's, you know, let's just get this done. A few months ago, Mock and Herbert teamed up and set up shop in a city community center in the heart of Anacostia. Inside, previously owned, donated, and even new furniture, along with clothes, books, and family games. I'm thinking about the name Furnish Hope, and boy, that really has some levels to it, doesn't it, when you think about it? Yeah, I think that what it says, Furnish Hope. So it's bigger than just furniture. When people come in, they're in despair, they're confused, they're depressed. And our goal, Nikki and I, is always to see them smile when they leave. One of those smiles came from Ashley Kennan. The wife and mother of three lost her job and home while battling opioid addiction after a surgery. She was able to get back on her feet and get a home, but couldn't afford furniture. So at first, it, I was just happy about the apartment. And then my children, they kept asking, oh, when are we going to get a couch? Untied this hard floor, this, that, and the third. And then that's when it was just, it was depressing. So you find Furnish Hope. What was that like? I didn't believe it at first. And she was like, pick everything you want for your house. I was like, huh? She was like, yeah, pick everything you want for your house. I was like, no, no, you lying. Like sitting in, in shock and she was laughing. She was like, I'm serious, go. So I just started jumping up and down. I gave her the biggest hug ever. I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much. And the cost for furniture, absolutely nothing. Furnish Hope DC even delivers for free. Yes, for free. You don't, we don't want anything. We just want you to take it and be happy and go home and eat at the table like you deserve. Your children deserve everything that my family has, that her family has, that any American family should have. You deserve it. How do you know someone is in need and that they're just not looking for free furniture? So to go in the homes is very disheartening when you get there. Yeah. So you no doubt know. You can just hear the words people use and you can see like the joy when they go pick up a certain piece and you're like, yeah. you know, you just see it. And many times families send back pictures yes. and videos like this one posted on Furnish Hope DC's Facebook page. Yeah. Furnish Hope DC has already helped nearly 200 homes in the six months it's been running. What does that mean to you? 
What I think about is all the phone calls I'm getting every day and the people that are coming every day and are going on our website and are going on our Facebook page that are multiplying and multiplying, and I'm so nervous. We I'm can't not gonna keep be, up. be able to keep up. For now, Mock plans to keep loading up her truck to continue furnishing hope. It's not like we're anybody has to sacrifice or you have to take away from someone. There is enough. We have enough. We just have to figure out a way to distribute it and, you know, to make life more fair for people. Kenneth Moten, ABC News, Washington. Some much needed help or thanks to Kenneth. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Workers install 192 new Waterford Crystal Triangles featuring this year's gift of wisdom design on the Times Square New Year's Eve ball. That's a lot of bling. The celebrations in New York City this weekend will be scaled back due to the Omicron wave. And that is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Rachel Scott. Thanks for streaming with us.